Hello, this is Alex Dyer, uh, Candy Ordinary for the Episcopal Church in Colorado. Uh, and I am here with David Gordner, who is not a priest in our diocese, uh, but is a wonderful priest and uh, has a long track record with working in the church. David, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and introduce yourself to the people here in Colorado? Sure, hi, I'm David Gordner, as Alex said. And uh, for 11 years, I was, um, Director of the Doctor of Ministry program, Professor for Evangelism and Congregational Leadership, and uh, later in the sequence, Associate Dean for Church and Community Engagement at Virginia Theological Seminary. Before that, uh, over eight years <coughs> previous, I taught at um, CDSP, and uh, before that at Seabury Western. Um, so I've been in Chicago, California, Virginia, and now uh, I'm in, um, uh, the Diocese of Spokane. My wife is Dean of the Cathedral here, and I am serving uh, a parish in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, across the border. So, um, delighted to be with you all. Wonderful, and I'm delighted you're here as well. And David, you, you've taught me uh, a great deal uh, about many things, uh, and one of them being uh, kind of introducing <laughs> Uh, the concept, uh, and did a lot of stuff under the, the DMIN program with you about adaptive change and technical fixes, uh, which is something that the church has kind of latched on to, I'd say, at least in the last decade, if not before. Um, and you know, we have read a book here, uh, at least a lot of leaders uh, in this particular diocese called Canoeing the Mountains uh, by Todd Bolsinger. Uh, and he goes into a great deal about that as well too. But for those who are not familiar with those terms of adaptive uh, and technical fixes, you know, what, can you explain that to me in a little bit? Sure. Um, it's a way of thinking about the system that you're a part of and the challenges that come up in the system. So um, to, as a prelude, uh, and this is quoting from one of uh, Ron Heifetz's books, The Practice of Adaptive Leadership. Uh, he says that um, there's a myth that drives many uh, changes, change initiatives into the ground, that the organization needs to change because it's broken. But the reality is that any system, including an organization or a country or a family or a church system, the way it is because the people in that system, at least those individuals and factions with the most leverage, want it that way. Mm -hmm. Chew on that for a moment. Mm -hmm. Exist in the organizations that include their brokenness or their oddness because actually we've come accustomed to them and we don't want them to change. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the undergirding thread. When we get to the concept of making technical changes, that's really making rapid, quick changes that are, uh, the problem is clear, mm -hmm. we know what the issue is, mm -hmm. and the solution seems clear. And it's uh, within our repertoire, and we can move it fairly quickly because there's clear line of authority saying, hey, go do this. When we face more muddy challenges, um, the problem may be clear, um, but it requires learning. And then um, you got to have a mix of conversation. It can't just be, hey, go do this, because yeah. we all and what the solution is. Adaptive change is when we don't actually even understand the problem itself. It's muddy to begin with, not just the solution, but the problem. Um, and um, so then, then it really takes everyone to think together. Um, and I, and, I think and, we're, you're definitely living in an adaptive moment here, because uh, I think, you know, it's information, everything is murky, yeah. for figuring this stuff well, out. Well, your analogy, yeah, your analogy of uh, canoeing the mountains, uh, you know, it's, yeah. uh, well, like right now is like canoeing the mountains, but the mountains are moving yeah. while you're walking. And um, it's, it's really um, a very different kind of reality. We don't know what's ahead because things are shifting constantly. Well, I think there's this great line in the book, too, where, where he talks about from the field journals of Lewis and Clark, which is what it's based on, you know, and, and, and they talk about the, the Explorers Party going up and them seeing the Rocky Mountains ahead of them um, and even being told about them, but they, they could not even conceptualize it. They still have the Appalachian Mountains kind of, you know, because that's what they knew. Uh, and, right. Right. and there's this, this, you know, where they get up to this mountain pass, a little middle pass, 
uh, and they look and th there's just this line that says, and there appear to be mountains upon mountains, some of which still have snow on them. Um, and I think even at the top, they just couldn't conceptualize it uh, type mm -hmm. of thing too. And I think, you know, even as, a, as, you know, I think leaders in my conversation with leaders, that's kind of where we're at. Yes, it seems like it's shifting, but we, we can't even begin. Even what's in front of us and the information that we have, it's hard for us to really take it all in, especially when it changes all the time. So it's even, it's even a little more intense than that, because as I said, you know, it's like right now, it's like they wake up the next morning and the mountains have shifted in a different, yep. you know, they're not the same as what they were the night before. And we're in a mode where um, it's also um, after the initial crisis um, mm -hmm. and it's ongoing, but we, again, don't know where we are or what the solution is mm -hmm. uh, with the pandemic. So, um, so this is, um, it's like being dropped in the water. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, I think it's, you know, very disorientating as leaders. And we've talked about, you know, how churches possibly need to change and we're, you know, yeah. uh, into this new future. And I think uh, we had some concept of that before, of kind of the directory. And it seems like at a pace we could kind of manage uh, type of thing. Yeah. We, we Maybe, you know, on argument, maybe we weren't keeping pace where we need to be. Uh, but you know, it still felt manageable, but now it feels like something is totally different. Uh, so, so given that, you know, it's totally different, uh, and the mountains are changing all the time and information, you know, kids can't get it. Well, wait, some kids can, you know, uh, you know, it doesn't affect this, but oh, it does affect, you know, all these different things, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, all that, all that kind of stuff, um, coming in. What do leaders at this particular moment need to be thinking about? So there's, there's another term that's been floating around in the um, business world before cr the coronavirus mm -hmm. called disruption. Mm -hmm. And um, this notion that um, disruption happens in the marketplace. Um, it just something new comes in unforetold and unforeseen and boom, you're off on a different course. And that happens in politics, in government, that happens in uh, economics and that happens in uh, religious life as well. Um, so disruption is even kind of more than um, adaptive change can be a nice thing that we undertake when we have some still still solid sense of what the overall structure is. Mm -hmm. Move the thing because the thing is still somewhat the thing. But right now we're not sure what the thing is going to be. Mm -hmm. So it's even even a little more uh, disruptive. And that's that takes us into kind of some of the literature on trauma. Mm. Um, and you know what what happens to in a nation when everything falls apart? Um, well first there's there's kind of survival mode. And I think a lot of us are kind of feeling that just in our own congregations, mm -hmm. um, our communities. Um, I was just on the phone with some of my parishioners, or not phone, Zoom, uh, with my parishioners uh, yesterday. And one was saying, uh, I think I'm done for a while going out. I'm finding myself withdrawing more. I'm not depressed. Mm -hmm. I'm withdrawing and kind of liking doing that. And I'm not sure that I like the fact that I'm liking that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's the big adjustment that's happening right all through strata and levels of society down to the family level and individual level. Mm -hmm. So how do we respond to that as leaders? What, do, what, do, what should we be doing in this moment? One of the early things I started talking about during this Easter season with my congregation was um, that, um, and, and even back in Lent, I said, you know, this is an invitation to a kind of fast that we have not experienced before um, and not asked for. Um, and yet it asks us, it provides an opportunity for us to engage spiritual muscles that perhaps we have neglected because we have overemphasized other muscles and opportunities for spiritual enrichment and come to rely on those too much. It's kind of like in, in uh, meal planning, um, well, I really like chicken. Uh, so every meal is going to include chicken. As a matter of fact, I ran into a guy in the gym who said, uh, you know, 
he goes through um, four chickens a week. Wow. And his regiment and then his gym work. Haven't seen him in a couple months, of course, you know. <laughs> but, um, but maybe the move now is to re-engage some of the deeper spiritual practices that we are actually invited to and supposed to be doing anyway. Yeah. Which is our individual prayer life, which is meditation on Christ and opening ourselves to the presence of Christ in our own spaces and opening to that kind of inner transformational work that happens in quiet. Um, we didn't all sign on to be uh, Cistercian monks and nuns, um, but this season invites us to taste what that life can open up for us in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Can open up is a way of being that if we ground ourselves deeply in it, will put us in a place of re-engaging society in a very different way. We're, we're not just tugged easily. Well, and I think it's also finding the monastic, you know, side is great, but you know, I have a four-year-old, so it's kind of hard to live a monastic life uh, type of thing too. Sure. But how, do you, how do you find God, you know, in the midst of all this, right? You know, it's great to find God even in a quiet church, you know, in the midst of corporate worship or whatever too. But right. where is God, you know, in the midst of my life right now? Uh, and force, you know, examine that with, you know, the screaming four-year-old in the kitchen and kind of everything kind of going on, you know. Or the person who's unemployed. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, and wondering where the next meal is going to come from that didn't ever experience this before. So there's this tendency, I think, for all of us, right, and humans to kind of go back to the way things were, especially when kind of stuff's been disrupted, you know, but back to that familiar, whether it be chicken or, or whatever, you know, the familiar is to us, uh, to the muscles we know and are good to us. So as, as leaders, uh, how do we manage that? How do we deal with people who are uh, acting probably maybe, you know, out of a sense of wanting to go back and maybe even acting out uh, as a part of that, you know, really, not in a necessarily malicious way, but just a real strong desire uh, and human tendency for us to get back to the way things were, some sense of normalcy uh, that I think all of us are kind of craving. What advice would you give to a leader uh, in that situation? It's um, inviting folks to live, uh, again, I'm gonna go back to the prayer analogy, um, give us this day our bread that is sufficient for today, you know? Um, that's our prayer. And it's hard for us as Americans, particularly, that think we have a lot more control than we do, to go to that place and say, today's what I have. Um, don't wanna do it. But that's some of the space that we probably need to go back to and occupy as the centering space Today is today. Your four-year-old probably understands this better than you do, right? Now is now. Yes. Right? <laughs> there is no right? past, there is no future. It is now. <laughs> it is now, right? Uh, and so that's that's sort of what we have to live, um, and to live as fully and faithfully into now as we can, um, with the the small bits of future that we can plan out. We're working with clergy, you know, I still am connected with VTS, working with clergy across the country uh, in different groups. And we were gonna gather in September, late September. We're now saying, can we do it? Do we have to cancel or postpone the event? Do we do it online? And so we're having to weigh different options. So we have to plan three things at the same time. Um, that's some of what comes from this time. Um, and, we do the best dance we can. Yeah. Um, and I think holding, holding that tension is tough, you know, even for, if for anybody, I think to, to yeah. that. I mean, there's one great line that we've been saying over and over again, the vicious stuff is, you know, uh, I forget the, the person who said it, but uh, you know, basically it sums up as leadership is disappointing people at a rate they can absorb. Uh, and I, and I think having to disappoint people is always tough. But I yeah. think we may be called to do that at times uh, during this thing of holding that tension. I don't know if you've seen the, the piece that came out from ERD 
um, the the Episcopal Relief and Development um, that about the um, the chart of yeah. where people can be during a um, yeah. uh, disaster yeah. major crisis or disaster, and the more prolonged the disaster or crisis or pandemic lasts. The more you move from a kind of immediate rallying, which I think we did experience, particularly going toward Holy Week, um, people did the very best they could, and then you know, I found myself kind of going, "Oh, now what? What now?" You know, um, and that that is part of my individual response. But I see a little bit of that happening in my congregation too. Of the, oh, how much longer is this going to be? Yeah. And, and just pointing to that and saying, that's actually the natural response we're in right now. Mm -hmm. And it sucks, you know, <laughs> but that's, that's part of our life. And let's not take that and act out in. Mm -hmm. life. Well, and, and I heard we're in that stage. I read another article where we're kind of in that stage of uh, they've studied people in isolation, space stations and, whatever out in the yard mm -hmm. or whatever too if we you know this is the toughest kind of stage we're in kind of that it seems like it and it may not be but it appears psychologically that you know we flatten the curve and we're coming you know that, that second half uh type of thing and not the entire half it's like a portion of that if we can push through it it's good but it's not atypical for for people to get really either you know uh knocked out and not act out of their best selves or um really kind of be uh, not in a good space but if we can push through that that's where at. so yeah it's a tough this time is, for me. and unfortunately it coincides with easter <laughs> so right. it's Easter season well if you want to if you want to press the adaptive kind of question um i see hints of discussion of this that on one hand can seem heartless but on the other hand are um people trying to weigh the decisions for a society as a whole and for the world as a whole um, and it, it's one of those very difficult decisions of, you know, if we continue to shelter in place, that's going to mean more poverty, more mm -hmm. uh, cost, I mean, cost, really deep cost for a lot of people. Domestic violence, yeah. Life threatening in and of itself. If we don't shelter in place, there are going to be costs of lives. Um, and when you're presented with that kind of choice. Yeah. This is like the, the worst of the Ignatian or Jesuit kind of um, um, discernment kind of questions mm -hmm. between one good that's better than the other or one evil that's worse than the other. There are really thorny challenges that people are having to grapple with. And, um, and the intensity of people's response is because it's felt. Um, so we have to be attentive to that depth of of heartfelt gut kind of stuff that's going on in people. Um, at the same time, as inviting them to a space of trying to step back and think about there is this bigger picture. Um, and and it, it doesn't look good no matter which direction you go. Yeah. That's that's the reality we're in. Well, I'm sure we could go on and on and talk about this. I I, I yeah. can probably talk to you for another uh, <clears throat> hour or so on this too. But uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, you know, maybe we can talk again later on down the road. Uh, but you know, love to with the wisdom that you've brought to here the Episcopal Church in Colorado uh, as we try to navigate uh, these new territory that we are in. So you will be in my prayers as. Uh, mm. You continue in your vineyard, and uh, hopefully, you can keep us in uh, our prayer or your prayers as we continue in our vineyard as well. Absolutely, God be with you all. Thank you. <laughs>